Ladies and gentlemen, Hebrews and Shebrews, today we're talking to Azure Standard CEO and founder David Stelzer, all about how he came into the Torah, how he manages his all of his farmland via the laws in the Bible, and all about health food, why he created Azure Standard, and why he and his team created Azure Well, the offshoot that is a supplement line of whole food um, supplements, non-synthetic. And we'll talk about healing your body with food. If you love what we're doing, like, share, subscribe, hit the bell, the whole nine yards. Tell people about it. Let's get into it. I, I would just like to talk about you, your family, kind of a coming into Torah observance as well. And and then the farm and Azure eventually leading into Azure Standard. So I'll walk us through it with questions and you can just answer. And we, it can be a conversation. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess uh, in a way we came into Torah observance kind of backwards from what most people have. Um, you know, I am from um, Semitic background. My uh, forefathers came from, well, they were from Ukraine, but they had lived in Ukraine for many generations before, but it wasn't Ukraine then, it was either Russia or Poland. It's now Ukraine. Um, and they came over here about, oh, 110 years ago or something like that. Um, but they completely lost it. And they became, you know, kind of mainline well, Christian, if you will. Uh, so fast forward, um, you know, 60, 70 years. Uh, we had, um, you know, because of some health issues that uh, we came into the concept of healthy eating and organic farming. And so when we first started farming organically, and truthfully, this is more my dad than I at that time. I was still fairly young. And we started farming organically. You know, we were faced with quite a few, quite a few problems. Uh, because the land, you know, after using chemicals for a while, it becomes dependent. It's kind of like a drug addict. You know, it's dependent on the, the chemicals that you put on. It takes a little while for the you know, the natural microbiome to reestablish itself and be able to produce naturally the way that, you know, God made it from the very beginning. So when we were in that transition period, we began to, um, you know, look for answers and, you know, friend and dad says, hey, well, answer for everything's in the Bible. And so he says, well, here I have this problem on how, which, you know, is there something on farming organic in the Bible? And, of course, you know, you go through the New Testament, there's not much there. If we go back to Torah, it actually has a few things. And so one of the things that came, came to mind was the land Sabbath. So there are every seven years. Now, this is limited because... This is only for things that last from year to year. So it doesn't, um, the land Sabbath is not for everything. It's only things that will keep, the, at least the way I read Torah. Now, some of the Jews disagree, and they actually sell their land to a Gentile and buy it back and all this crap. No, that's not the way it's supposed to be. You're supposed to just have a little grow a little extra each year and build up so there's enough to last over the sabbath year but anyway we came in started reading about the sabbath year it says well that every seven years your land should rest we also read about some of the forefathers uh, early american including george washington he actually rested his farm every seventh year, but he didn't do it all at once. He rested every field every seven years on a rotational basis. When I was reading some history, and he has, he even wrote a whole paper on that, what that did for me. his soil. No, no. So he, he, you know, he grew his crops every year, but every, you know, 
seventh field was set aside to be fallow for the year. And so. Great. Um, so we got to, you know, dad says, oh, I don't know. I mean, how would we ever know what the Sabbath year is supposed to be? Um, you know, it's like, and so, and that would have been 1977, I guess. So this is a long time ago. And uh, we had, in 77, at least here in Oregon, we had a terrible drought. But it was a late drought. It came on late. And the grain crops and stuff that keep uh, did really well that year. was one of the best years we'd had since transitioning to organic agriculture. It was the best year we'd had. Um, but, you know, here you normally plant in the fall, and the drought was so late. The and there was almost no overwintering soil moisture, and so the next year there was basically nothing. And we saw, um, I mean, it was probably the only super crop failure we've ever experienced. And and it grew a little bit, you know, but it was really short. You couldn't hardly even harvest it. And there were birds that came in that we'd never seen before or since that came in and devoured that crop. And it was like, it was like a sign from heaven that that was the Sabbath year. We shouldn't have, we shouldn't have ever planted that year. And, How old were you at this time, or were you born then at this time even? Yeah, yeah. No, I was, uh, I was like 10 years old, 10, 11 okay, years okay. old. So I remember it very well. So you were observing your your father trying to keep the commands, basically, trying trying to keep the commands. But the funny part is, before that, we never looked at the rest of the Torah as being of any value. But then, after looking at that, we kept that year, and then the following year, we had you know all the weed pressure and stuff because the way the rotation. Now you had a fallow year; all the weeds were destroyed. Shouldn't say all. There was you know, they're not, it's not a hundred percent. And then you go in and plant and you break that cycle. So it's like we had a fresh start. And so the next year we did really well again. And really that was the first year that wasn't just a struggle to survive when the soil began to rejuvenate itself was after observing that Sabbath year. And we actually have done it every seven years since then, still to this day. Well, three years ago but uh, however that math wow. comes out but so I, all right i have a i have a selfish question for you then because i'm here on a very small homestead 15 acres i mean small by your standards i think what would you do i'm in, in the middle of ohio this land has been farmed for like the last 200 years likely maybe 150 i bet it hasn't had any sabbaths and I thought, should I give it all of its Sabbath that it needs uh, for the last 150 years? And I've been thinking about that. And uh, what are your thoughts on that? Just, <laughs> I know that's a curveball. It's not on our list, but I'm just wondering because I'm curious. <laughs> so we have purchased Pardon. land that hasn't been Sabbath since then. And we just roll it into the rotation. We don't give it okay. four or five years of Sabbath all at once. We just roll it into the rotation, and we're going to give it the Sabbath on the Sabbath year. That's okay. just the way. What else can you do? It's like. <laughs> well, you could, yeah. but, you know, hey, do you want to leave it lay fallow for 10 years and let the, you know, the pine trees grow back or whatever it is that tries to take over in Ohio um, and then have to re-clear it? Yeah. You know, I don't, you know, I'm I'm not proposing that. If you're growing sure, crops sure. in it, um, you know, and you know, shoot, uh, the crops that grow um, product or grow vegetables and stuff that are each year, we do rotate our sabbaths on that land. Okay. So okay. because you have things that don't keep from year to year. We feel like you can grow those on the Sabbath year. Otherwise, it would completely destroy your markets. And you wouldn't because, you know, if you don't have a consistent supply, they have to go somewhere else. But what we do on that is we rotate into a different area where we don't usually grow vegetables. 
and then okay and then sabbath the vegetable ground and then move it back the following year that makes sense so That's, it's all all the land's getting some seventh year rest but it's on a rotation like george washington <laughs> well just for the perishables all the unperishables okay. we do all the same year it's all one okay thing. okay if it's wow. if it's if it's if it's not perishable, if it's grain, you know, wheat, beans, anything like that, it's all the same year. Okay, okay. Wow, that's amazing. Well, the, but here, anyway, I'll... that's what oh. that's what led us to start and look at it, Torah, because then they said, well, if it's you know one of uh, you know one of the neighbors said, well. How come how come you are so worried about what year the Sabbath year is and you don't even keep the right Sabbath day? And so that was kind of the next um the next step in our journey towards um Torah observ obser observant uh, behavior. Wow. Well, I guess uh yeah, is Sunday really not the Sabbath? Sure enough. Uh, well, I guess we better change. So we changed one thing after another and um, to become more and more in line with, well, you know, what God expects of us as he lays out in the Torah. At that time... Were there any kids your age or any families your parents knew who were doing this as well? Not very many. We did end up, within the next five years or so, we did end up meeting a few families. Um, not necessarily in the agricultural side, but that were, um, you know, keeping the Torah the best they could at some level. And we actually kept our first feast days with that that those families. Um, that would have been in, I'm guessing, around '83 or so. The first <laughs> time we actually uh, kept, uh, you know, tabernacles, and but we've been doing it ever since. And then you continued this. Did you ever have a moment in your life when you were getting older and you 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 it became your own, quote unquote, or you wrestled with this and you thought, are we really doing what's right? And I don't know. Or did it, did it make sense to you? In many ways, I think I drove it more than dad did. I I guess I was I was an observant person uh, especially as a young person and so i would observe what i saw as being um the results of certain actions so i began to observe that the people who lived a life the most closely related to torah observation and i'm not talking necessarily about the ritual I'm talking about the the substance here. The ritual is great. It you know, it is what it is, but the substance was what really counts. You know, are we doing, you know, shall we say the 10 commandments and everything that's laid out around those? This episode of the Life Podcast is brought to you by The Way Documentary, The Truth, Reformation 2.0 Apologetics Book, and Truth Tracks. The Way documentary tells the story of our movement. This is the story of people who were trading Easter ham for Passover lamb and Sunday church for Saturday Sabbath, all in an effort to live like their savior. It dives into their stories through their own voices and into the history and theology that show how the church got to where it is today. The Truth, Reformation 2.0 is the only book of its kind, an all-encompassing theological treatise that answers every question a mainstream Christian might have about why you want to keep Torah. And finally, truth tracks are small comics beautifully illustrated that use stories and scripture to remind Christians that once we are saved by grace through faith, we are called to live and do the instructions of Yah, his Torah. 
If you want to learn more about any of these products, go to thewaydoc.com. That's the way, D-O-C, like documentary, dot com. The closer they, that their life was to those principles, the more prosperous and happy life that they lived. They went, there was a lot less pain, injury, and abuse in their life. It seemed like every, that everything smiled. Not that there weren't things they got to go through. Everybody gets to go through hardships, but they were healthier. They lived more <laughs> happy, family-centric lives. You know, and if you look at what, you know, so I came to the conclusion fairly early in my, you know, <laughs> before I started my own family, I came to the conclusion that um, that God gave us his law for us and not because he wanted us to keep, that his law was more like the owner's manual for us. That's kind of the way I viewed it at that point in time. I see it slightly different now, but it still makes sense. So if we want our lives, you know, this is both physically and emotionally and psychologically, the closer that we live our lives in uh, to the owner's manual, just like the closer we take care of our car to the way the owner's manual says, the longer it's going to last and probably the less breakdowns you're going to have. The closer we live our lives to Torah, the better our, we're going to last and the fewer breakdowns and heartaches and, and disasters that we're going to have in our life. And do we want a lot of heartaches and drama in our life? Or do we want to live a life that's productive without a lot of heartaches and drama? And, uh, you know, so that was kind of the way I came to that conclusion. Hey, it's not necessarily about, you know, what what God wants, although I see a... a you know, that that's a part of it. But this is what will give us a life that's most productive. And I think that's really what he does want. And, you know, truthfully, Azure probably wouldn't exist if I hadn't come to that conclusion early on. Because, you know, I guess before um, beginning to look at Torah, I was, you know, with the general uh, Christianity, so to speak, you know, I would begin to see, oh, it's all about what, how we live our life now so we can either go to heaven or Jesus will come back and take us up with him whenever he comes back because this world gets wicked enough that he's coming back. When I start reading Torah, neither one of those things even come into play. They're not even they're not even on the radar. In Torah, it's all about multi generational faithfulness. It's about fathers teaching your children, teaching your grandchildren. It's about preparing for the next generation, and it's about um, honoring the work that your forefathers did before you and passing that down. It's a long term. It's a long run. It's multi-generational. It's about, you know, it's about our um, connection with the land. How many times does it say, if you don't keep these commandments, the land will spew you out? If we do keep the commandments, the land, we will be a husbandman to the land. The land is here long term for as long as there's summer and winter and as, you know, he put it in Genesis. We, as stewards of that land, if we're faithful, we will be here long term as well from generation to generation. And that's what he promised. And that's what Torah is all about in a very strong way. And the more we, the closer we can come to keeping these commandments, hey, 
you know, if we live good moral lives, so to speak, we're much more likely to raise good moral children that are going to take on, you know, that are going to be able to take over as part of the next generation of faithfulness, whether that's the land or the business or the trade or whatever it is that we're working towards or the ministry. That's, it's a multi-generational, long-term concept. It's not about being good until we die, or it's not really about looking forward to Jesus coming back. It's about long-term, multi-generational faithfulness. And that's, I guess, there's my little rant of how I you know, so, came to that conclusion. It seems like the rant leads right in, which is not a rant at all. It's a beautiful perspective on on having a, a a long view of time that goes past your own death. <laughs> but is that well, the yeah. reason why a farmer would open up a massive food distribution company? Like that, that leads into the second question. What was your, insp <laughs> was that the inspiration, the Torah and this, this long view of, of time? Yeah. So in a way, yes. So it kind of, it kind of went, a couple different directions here but yes so if we look at you know if we're looking at life short term you know we just need to get through life we'll sell you know we'll try to make a living on this earth and be able to survive and you know if we survive you know the next generation heck you know half of christianity doesn't even have kids anymore Torah says that children are a blessing. When I learned that, you know, I totally went from, hey, we're going to have one or two kids to let's have as many kids as God gives us, because that's exactly what Torah teaches. So we ended up with 11. God gave us 11 kids. Congratulations. That's... <laughs> well, thanks. They're, you know, we're past that stage of life now, but, you know, now it's grandkids, but the... <clears throat> when we we think of that, when you're farming, especially if you're farming organically, in a way, you're out there, you're holding out a hand both directions and saying, how much? How much do I have to pay for every input? How much will you give me for this product? You're at the mercies of commodities markets on both sides of the equation. So if I'm looking at, you know, um, there is no incentive whatsoever to uh, create value and create a valuable product. The only thing that the farmer can control is quantity. So how much do you give me for my bushel of wheat? You can't control what that price is. That's controlled by the Chicago Board of Trade. You say, how much do I have to pay for the fuel or for the tractor? That's controlled by John Deere or OPEC or you know, whoever does those things. Um, and so your only control is over quantity. And so it's quantity over quality. Now, when we learned about health and about how nutrient-dense food plays into life and health and health of the body, and health of the body goes to the brain, which goes to the spirit and the soul. It's very important that we eat food that's nutrient dense. The farmer is the guardian of the nation's health. And, you know, and I can base that principle in Torah as well. That's, um, it's our responsibility to produce food that is not substandard that has the nutrients that will sustain life. Now, can I do that for Chicago Board of Trade prices? There's no way. It's not possible. Is there anybody in this world that really cares as well about the quality of their food? And my conjecture was that yes, there were people that cared. And so hence, that's kind of, you know, Azure was born because we were creating a product that was not 
just a Chicago Board of Trade type product. This is one step above. We It did not have chemicals on it. It wasn't the highest volume. It was the highest quality in the marketplace. And are folks willing to pay a premium for that? Well, maybe. But even greater than the premium is we learned that there are so many middlemen in this game that by cutting most of those out, that it really, to the end user, is not that much more expensive. So it's quite cost effective to get nutrient dense food. That's at least one step above what comes off the conventional market. And I'm not saying everything's perfect. Azure works with a lot of growers now. It's not all our stuff. Um, so, you know, we get, you know, we do vet those. We vet those very carefully. Um, but I'm not saying that everyone is 100% of the way there. They're not. It's everyone's on a journey. And it's one mm -hmm. step. But I will guarantee that everything's one step above what you're going to get at, you know, Costco or Walmart or any place else, even if they do put the organic label on it. Wow, that's great. And that's, Can you, you know... Can you talk so about I started how you... out as a marketing oh, agency, right? I started out to market our own product, and then people wanted okay. everything else. Okay. On that standard, the Azure standard, can you talk about that and, and how you kind of – the criteria you have for what you stock and, and what you'll accept and then contrast it with what people are going to find in Kroger's? Well, that's what we have out here in Ohio. <laughs> Walmart. Okay. Well, you know, certainly there's no nothing on the Azure uh, website that's going to be genetically modified, uh, which is uh, you're not going to find that very many places. Hmm. Wow. Um, we have probably the largest selection of certified organic products. We have a I think 65 deep or something like that, banned in unacceptable ingredient list. I think larger than probably any other <laughs> retailer for sure, which does include a couple things most others don't, including pork and shellfish is on our banned list. And obviously cool. for Torah, Torah reasons. And then we go into the hidden ones like um, natural flavors. So in natural flavors, they hide all kinds of garbage. So we have some things that have natural flavors, but we have vetted every single one of those. And we wow. have a list of all the things that are usually hidden under natural flavors that are not acceptable. This, so This push towards quality, um, it I, I read about your history, and it's – partly inspired by you having asthma, right? And then recovering from that as a kid and your father. Eh. Yeah, so there was, yeah. So when I was a kid, <clears throat> um, my earliest memories are laying on the couch, not knowing if I was going to be able to take another breath, struggling for breath. It was like I couldn't hardly breathe. Um, you know, the doctors had told my parents that I probably weren't, was not going to make it because, um, and the symptoms were asthmatic. They technically weren't asthma, but they, um, they were originally mistaken for asthma. Um, and, uh, about this, a, a little bit before that, my grandfather, the one who actually came from Ukraine, he had heart disease really bad. He couldn't even step on a tractor. He had to retire early. It was, you know, pretty bad. And so this is actually my mom came into the family. And my mom's father, he he had been on the health journey a little bit. So he told my dad's dad, which is the one who came from Ukraine, that, you know, hey, if you, you know, there's some stuff you can do for heart. You know, you can... Uh, not eat so much, much fatty meat and stuff, and uh, particularly uh, pork and that kind of thing, and eat a lot of garlic. And so granddad 
he did that. He quit eating pork. He quit eating a lot of fatty meats. He leaned up his diet, reduced his sugars and refined carb intake, uh, and ate at least five cloves of garlic every day. A year later, he was working 18 hours a day again. He completely healed up from his heart disease. So this was just right about the time I was born. I was fine for the first nine months or so. But I was, you know, I was just on my mother at that point, right? And so, but they didn't know what, what caused it. All of a sudden, I get all these symptoms. And it was, um, you know, I can't remember. You know, I can't breathe. They take me to the doctor. Yeah, I probably won't make it. This is extremely severe asthma. Maybe we can get an inhaler, these drugs and this and that. And so they started looking, my parents started looking for another answer and eventually went to several different, ended up with a naturopath up in the Spokane area that um, said he would go. And so he did a bunch of testing and he said, that it was the most severe allergy that he'd ever seen in his life. And so he claimed that it was just a food allergy. And it turns out that that was more or less correct. So apparently I was born, once I looked into it later, I was born with without a microbiome in place to be able to digest particularly animal products, but particularly dairy products but I really can't, um, almost can't handle any animal products. My microbiome just doesn't have it, still to this day. I didn't outgrow it. I still am almost vegan, not quite. Uh, I can handle a little bit of eggs. Uh, you know, I don't have to be extremely careful on the meat side, but I, on the dairy side, I have to be extremely careful. Um, I just don't digest it at all now none of my kids ended up with that they're all they're all fine that way but um however however that came about that sounds um, like my son sam he if you put milk on his arm it, he'll get a rash and if he eats it it's it's no good so once i was able to get that completely out of my diet i began to recover but I also found out that I was very sensitive to refined sugars. So pretty much my whole life, I mean, I can have carbs like fruit or vegetables, uh, even starchy vegetables are fine, but um, or grains, but no refined sugars. I pretty much completely stay away from that kind of stuff because I get the reaction from that as well. So I've learned that there's some specific dietary, you know, and I don't, well, I kind of recommend anybody to not do many refined sugars. That's good for anybody to get off of that, but not necessarily the, the dairy and uh, animal products. Many people have a microbiome that really needs it. In fact, when my wife and I first got married, we were thinking, oh, she says, oh, I don't really care much. Let's just eat you know, more like, uh, you know, this vegan, more like you have to eat. And uh, she actually got quite ill. And we went and, and tried to figure it out. What? I mean, because she's eating way cleaner than she used to, and she's getting ill. And we figured out that she has a microbiome that needs a, that needs a lot more protein. She can't utilize the protein from plants like I can. And so she actually um, has to eat meat. And once we put meat back in her diet, it all went away. She's been fine. So it's That's not, amazing. you know, it's not, it, I think that's a, it's a microbiome. And that's one of the things at Azure here, we try to have a wide variety of products. We don't necessarily subscribe to one you know, special diet or anything like that. Our whole thing is about being clean. Nobody can needs the genetically modified. Nobody needs the, you know, the conventional glyphosate. Nobody needs preservatives of all and red dye and everything else that is absolutely destructive. 
in our system. There is a certain amount of variation from person to person based on your, you know, the way that your body utilizes food and digestion and all of that. Um, so organic meat versus organic beans, you know, hey, what's good for one person may be different for somebody else. But we need good quality. The last thing we need is, if you're doing meat, the last thing you want is meat that have been injected full of antibiotics and hormones. That's, you know, or even grazed right on land that just got Roundup sprayed on it last week. And that's all allowed in conventional. They do all of those this, things. This is starting to become more known, more mainstream, at least understood mainstream. But you guys had been on the leading edge of this decades before it was uh, known. Uh, is it, what led you to this? Was it yeah. maybe this is to, to thank your allergies, you know? <laughs> well, maybe, um, you know, a lot of it was my my parents and their journey on discovery. I mean, and there were a few other leaders back in that day. Dr. Paul Bragg was one of them. I mean, he was uh, teaching healthy lifestyle back in the 70s and 80s in a big, you know, in a big way. Uh, now you just, you know, see his name on a, you know, some consumer goods, but the guy actually was a genius before he's before his daughter actually did the consumer goods line. Um, he he wrote several you know a whole several books about healthy. He was uh, also he was the personal doctor for Jack Lelang, who was the fitness guru of the day back in those years. I don't know if you've even heard of him. You're probably too young, but. It's he somewhat a, familiar. You know, I know Bragg better, probably. But. Jack Lang, he had a he, he one of the earliest workout TV shows. Really, uh, he was considered to be one of the fitness gurus of like the seventies. Um, now there's That's a lot cool. of them. there's a lot of guys that do that kind of thing, have their own workout program or whatever. But you're um, right. <laughs> a lot of YouTubers. But, yeah. <laughs> A lot Speaking of them of... now, but back in those days, you know. <laughs> and many. Speaking of YouTubers, there are many YouTuber homesteaders who get these every month or week. They'll post their Azure hauls, and like all of the things they ordered from you guys. Is that something that you expected or planned for? Or did this just they... happen? <laughs> <laughs> that just happened naturally. People started doing that. Um, we did actually, a year or so ago, after started doing quite a bit, we actually started, uh, you know, re, uh, resharing some of them when we had permission to do so. Um, and I think uh, our marketing department put a, like a medley of those together with all different people from around the country talking about their Azure Hall. And it was kind of, you know, kind of cool. It's, it's pretty but cool. It's still, I mean, they're still doing it. It's really, it's really fun to watch. And then they explain sometimes why they ordered what they ordered. And yeah. That's it's, great. It's I mean, great. the best no, marketing I, I, is comes from the heart, <laughs> I guess, you know? Yeah. No, we don't pay them to do that. That's the, yeah, yeah. that's hundred percent their their thing. I mean, it would probably be a good marketing concept, but I don't know if you could make it up. I don't no. think you could play act that it's all real. I mean, you know, we don't. That's great. <laughs> I'm. What are? Can we get into some of the business challenges that you you've encountered trying to do this? I mean, create in creating this business like what what were some of the challenges of sourcing the high quality organic food or i guess what are the ongoing ones as well well for as far as sourcing goes you know there's limited there's limited quantity of quality food 
Hmm. So the challenge has been creating the relationships with the suppliers. Now, I think, you know, we've been doing this for 35 years. So I feel like we have a lot of relationships that are pretty deep with with growers, with manufacturers, um, with people that will help with our product line, with other companies that we distribute for that, you know, at least meet our minimum requirements. Um, you know, everything is vetted to our kind of minimum requirements, but, you know, then there's some things that go beyond. But, you know, there's still times when we can't find something. And instead of filling in with lesser quality, we just don't have it. At least, you know, usually it's temporary because the market, you know, the growers will grow what they know they have a market for. And if there's a shortage, uh, the price goes up, you know, next year, there's going to be more people going for it. I'm, do you ever do you ever communicate with the growers and say, hey, we we're out of X. And, you know, if you're planning absolutely. to. I, okay, okay. I used to personally do pretty much all of that. I have two people now that do that on our team. Um. And I still I still talk to growers occasionally. I usually vet them for the first time and talk to them. Um, some of them I go see if we're if we're looking at larger quantity contracts, but pretty much everyone I talk to the first time. Talk That's to them cool. about their growing practices, about, you know, their vision. You know, sometimes there's people that are in it because they believe in it. And there's others that are just in it because they see some premium dollars, uh, you know, for organic, uh, you know, or, you know, high nutrient product or whatever they want to call it. And, uh, you know, I tend to try to shy away from those, try to find the ones that are in it because they believe in it, because they're believers. And... <clears throat> But then once I vet them the first time, I usually turn them over to the team and they're communicating with them all the time. You know, okay. we're going back and forth. We're talking about, especially, well, a little before this, but in the winter time, we're always talking to farmers about their, their plans for their, their growing plans for next year. Oh, what do you need? What can we grow for you? You know, that's cool. Um, and it, you know, some of them we contract, some of them it's just, you know, a word, you know, our word. Um, and, you know, and truthfully, whether we have a signed contract or it's just the word, I, it's the same to me. I don't, word is word, you know, your word is your word. That's Torah in my book. That's and true. so if they, you know, if they, if I say we'll take it, if they can get, usually I have quality specifications. It has to hit quality specs even if i know they're a good grower i'm not going to take something that's subpar or super dirty you know you can't that um, makes sense <laughs> you know sometimes you'll have people you know even they're a good grower and they have all the right their vision and everything seems really good and they're right on the right page visionarily practicality sometimes they don't know how to make the hands do what the mind thinks it ought to do yeah or they just can't get around to it all or i i don't know but you know it takes yeah. it's hard it's hard too sometimes you know how it is well all right i have another kind of selfish farming question then this leads me to let's say i'm planning to grow grain here like an ancient grain something one year what would what would you generally grow the next year? Because you can't do grain two years in a row, right? Ideally, not. Um, okay. You said you're in Ohio, so. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't want to freak farm I'm consultation. Trying, I'm trying to but think I'm of. Uh, so, I'm trying to think <laughs> of some of the best things to grow. You know, I'm typically I would I would follow a grain crop most of the time with a legume. If okay. I were if I were in a high rainfall area like you are. 
I would probably go back and forth. So if I were going to go like einkorn, like an ancient grain, um, then I would raise um, a legume of some sort. So maybe a clover or a bean or something along those lines the next year, okay. depending on what it is. And I might do, if I were doing a clover, you'd maybe do a two or three year rotation. And then you might grow um, grain. I would probably come up with some kind of a rotational plan. So I do a legume, maybe a perennial legume like alfalfa or clover for like two years, maybe three, depending on you know how what your life cycle is um, back there. Again, I've only been to Ohio a couple of times. So I'm just trying to remember, and that was up in the kind of, I guess it would be the northeast corner. So, okay, okay. Um, <laughs> I think that's great advice. I... <laughs> so then I would put in my grain, and then I'd probably follow a small grain, like your einkorn or something. Then I'd follow it up with a larger grain, maybe like corn or milo or something like that, and then go back into the into the rotation. Okay, would you so you do it right after harvest, basically plant that larger grain and then then rotate back into the clover or well, the larger grain most of the time is gonna be like a spring crop. If you're gonna grow like einkorn, you're probably planting that in the fall. So if you're plowing down, if you have the moisture to do it and you can plow down your clover in the fall, work that up, plant that in I don't know, in Ohio it'll probably be the end of September, first October. Put that in, let that winter over, you have a winter crop on that. And then, you know, I would probably, you know, you harvest that, say, um, sometime in, I'm guessing Ohio would be July-ish, late July, early August. Then I'd go in probably either mow or a light disc, depending on the slope of your land, if you're flat or if you're hill, if you have a okay. hill um, slope to it. Because you don't want to, you don't want any soil erosion. That's you got to be very careful in high rainfall areas for that. And then, um, and then I would go in and you know mow that down. And if you can, put a cover crop in a short-term cover crop. Because if you're in the first of August, I would cultivate it up enough. You could put in a late clover or um, you know. And again, there's a few other um lupins and stuff like that that we use out here but whether i don't know if that works in ohio but you can find out what the best best legumes and i would do that as a cover crop over the winter and then i would plow that down in the spring after you had some growth on it and then put in a later um, season grain crop so like corn or milo or something like that because then you can use the nutrients from that plow down that green manure to raise your large grain crop i don't know does okay that, does that make sense that makes 100 percent sense that sounds great you you and just then once you, you, you do your large off. grain then then i would go back into some kind of a long a little bit longer term legume for for um you know cash crop purposes Okay. You know, for, and then for being something like that. Okay. Wow. Thank you. <laughs> but, you know, hey, cool. it depends what you want to grow. I mean, if you want to grow herbs or something, that's different. But, <laughs> no, I think I like, I like that because I was thinking einkorn. And so I thought, all right, let's see. How do we rotate out of that into something else? And oh, this will well, be einkorn, a first... you do have, you do have to get it hauled. <laughs> okay. Okay. You do know that, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah. I don't know much, but I'm learning a little. So, okay, back to Azure. Another couple of questions for you before we wrap it up. Uh, a new, so in my little town here in Ohio, just maybe last month, there's a new drop location, Azure awesome. drop location. How how do you establish one of those? How do you kind of, how do you, yeah, how did you create that network also across the U.S.? And can you talk about some of that? Yeah, so, you know, way back when, um, you know, I used to deliver basically to people's homes. And then it became obvious that 
I would have to charge a lot more to do that because that last mile is by far the most expensive part of, they call it last mile, might be the last eight or 10 miles, but the the last mile is by far the most expensive part of delivery. So hmm. if it's like UPS or FedEx or whoever, they spend way more money on that last mile than they do on getting it across the country. They don't necessarily tell you that, but that's the tr truth. And so we got to thinking, hey, is there a way to do this more cost effectively that um, instead of delivering to everyone's home, can we just go and deliver into the community? So we had some people, oh, they wanted to get just a little and said, well, can you just pick it up at so-and-so's place? So that's how it started 30 some years ago. So then we started, um, we started branding that kind of stuff. So we called it a drop point. Oh, this is an Azure drop point. Um, and whoever ran that, we called them the Azure drop point coordinator. And, you know, at first it started at people's homes and then a lot of it moved to churches, a lot of churches, Grange halls. Some of them are just the big parking lots beside the road. Every Everyone's different all over the country. And these, the people who run those are, they're all volunteers. We don't, they're not Azure employees. We don't control them in any way. And the drops sometimes will be a little different. We give some guidelines of what needs to happen. Um, but for the most part, they're, they're volunteering to do that. And there's, you know, some three or 4,000 of those across the country, people who have, are willing to volunteer some of their time every, you know, every month or every other week or some even every week to be able to receive the delivery and just to get healthy organic food into their local communities. And so then, you know, once they volunteer to do that, then we put them on our find a drop map. I don't know if you've seen the find a drop map. If you go to, you know, azurestandard.com down in the footer, there's a, a link that says find a drop. And so if I'm going into, and then you can just zoom in or you can type your city name and state in there. So if, you know, if you're in, you know, I don't know what part of Ohio you're in. If you're, I think Southern I was in Ohio. Akron area before. You're where? I'm in Southern Ohio, South of Columbus. Yeah, so, you know, and that's the cool part is if somebody steps forward and says, hey, I'd like to volunteer to have another drop in my community. Um, okay, do you have any friends or neighbors or enough to make it worth it so that there's enough of an order? And if they say yes, you know, I'm going to post it on the bulletin board at church and I'm going to talk to all the ch my church friends and, you know, I'm a member of the, you know, the ladies club or whatever the thing, you know, uh, the local Weston Price Foundation is a really good one um, for a, a lot of these, you know, moms. Um, then they say, oh, okay, we have a reasonable expectation that you're going to be able to make a specific minimum order of some sort, depending on how far off route it is. And then we just find a place where a truck can actually get to. We have to make sure that it's not, you know, they don't try to take us into a tight cul-de-sac or something because we're running full-size semi-trucks. Wow. And they... And it's, you know, we just added on to the list. And that's, you know, that's how we've grown over the over the years. One one at a time, one at a time. Can you talk just, to me a little was, bit about... Oh, sorry. <laughs> go well, ahead. sometimes they're radical and, you know, there's few places we don't even go. I, just, I was just talking to a person <laughs> up on the very northern tip of Michigan. It's like... It's like 200 miles from the nearest drop. They're not not on the peninsula, but up by up uh, way up at the top there. Top um, of the globe. On, yeah, <laughs> up above Wisconsin there. Oh and wow! So we just set one up way the heck up there, 
<laughs> and we're looking at trying to fill in in between now. So with our, you know, so I was talking to my marketing manager and said, hey, can we focus some emails into this area and try to fill this in so it can be a regular part of our every month delivery and not just, you know, when they can get something really big together. Hey, hopefully some viewers out there will reach out and be like, hey, we need it. I know there's some Michiganders yeah. up there. <laughs> wow. So yeah. can you talk to us a little bit about the pragmatic, like how the trucking works? And I, you have this, is it the serpentine, like permanent <laughs> ongoing truck loop and, and the shuttle trucks? We do routes and the truck goes out, comes back, out and back. Well, when we get further away, by the time the guy gets out there, he's out of hours. Can't even make the deliveries because, you know, their regulate trucking is regulated by how many hours they drive. So if I'm driving all the way to Ohio, I just burn through the greater part of my 70 hours in eight days. So I'm not going to be able to, you know, uh, to make the deliveries. So what we've done is we set up the the delivery trucks in these different areas. And, and the delivery trucks just do deliveries. And then the shuttles, we call them shuttles, they come from the warehouse and they meet the delivery truck wherever he gets empty. Doesn't really matter. So he stays in route, wherever you call it a serpentine route, but you know, it's all, you're right, it's all over. I guess you could call it that. I call it more of a string confetti route, but <laughs> it's, it goes all, all over the country. And some of the drivers stay on route sometimes all the time. And some of them, we fill them in various parts. Do you, and then, did you enjoy figuring out this problem? And do you enjoy this aspect of the business? I love figuring out the logistics. That's uh, our our logistics uh, actually give us a challenge, um, but when it works good, it's wonderful. And it also, you know, we're trying to improve it all the time. So logistics, I love doing, and I have a good team for it as well. You know, I can't I can't dispatch all the trucks and that anymore. I have a whole team that does that. We're shipping. I don't know, 10 to 12 trucks a day, probably. So at least on week, you know, weekdays. Um, wow. So, um, you know, that's quite a f quite a bit of dispatch to make happen. It's um, a ton. <laughs> but it's but as far as actually creating the jigsaw puzzle, yeah, that's that's really fun. Creating the routes. Adding, you know, sometimes adding in the drops. You, a few years ago, the news was talking all about supply chain fragility. And, and I mean, is the supply chain really quite fragile from your perspective? Or is this a scare tactic? Or what's your, your experience with that? And does it not affect you because of what you've set up here? Well, yes and no. It does affect us to some degree. As far as what we've set up with the domestic growers in the U.S. and even in the U.S. and Canada, it doesn't affect us a whole lot because we have those relationships. We also have the relationship with freight carriers to get it to us. And those are old and deep and they give us priority because we have, you know, we stuck with them when their times were hard and they stick with us when the freight's tight because they know we'll stick with them when the freight's light. Um, now, we did, and we still do, experience some of that when we're talking about international freight. So there, you know, we can't, everything that Azure carries, we can't get domestically. You know, there's not a real big, uh, shall we say, cocoa um, farm, you know, you can't get a lot of cocoa or chocolate domestically. You've got to go to a little tropical area or coconut or papaya or mango or, you know, cassava, you know, those Brazil nuts, cashews, all the things, right? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, even olive oil, it's not. Yeah, there's a little bit made in California, but such a small amount, it's really difficult to get. Plus, the higher quality stuff comes from the Mediterranean anyway. So we're importing olive oil from the Mediterranean region. Uh, that's where we've run into supply chain fragility. I think um, I was surprised how, you know, backed up some of these ports got. And when the ports back up, then there's fewer ships on the water because there's a bunch of them waiting to get into port. So they're not going across the ocean. And it really did create a backlog. Things that used to take, you know, three weeks to get across the Pacific, you know, if we're getting coconut from Indonesia or something like that, used to take three weeks. Uh, you know, during the height of the supply chain crisis was taking eight, and nine weeks. Now we're probably at five weeks for something that should take three. Um, okay. So, so it's still they're... not fully recovered. I didn't realize, I didn't no. realize that. Well, and I think the whole, um, pirates in the, in the, in the Red Sea is added to that because so many of the ships are going around the Horn of Africa. So it's taking them a lot longer on the water. So it's decreased the number of available ships worldwide because it's taking them two weeks or whatever it takes, maybe longer, three, four weeks to get, instead of going through the Red Sea and through the canal, if they're going from, say, India to Europe, you know, now they're, going all the way around because they don't want to mess with the instability in the Middle East. So there that's added, you know, added a lot of fuel to that fire. We just thought we were starting to get a little better and then that happened and it's you know, a few pirates and speedboats are out, you know, scaring these guys enough they're willing to go all the way around Africa to stay away from it. The old headquarters burned down a few years ago. Can you talk about that at all? And just say whatever you can and don't say what you can't. Well, I don't I don't know too much, truthfully. I don't have any idea why. Um, we actually, interestingly enough, we, it happened, it'll be two years in April, but we actually had set up in in the warehouse um, to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And we had a corner um, set up for that. And we were, we were, you know, and we had done that several, you know, quite a few times. And, but it happened right during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, I don't, I don't know if you guys do Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but typically it's kind of exciting and everyone stays late and it's kind of one of those things, right? Everyone's excited. No one goes home until the lights are kind of burning out. Uh, you know, we were there keeping Feast of Unleavened Bread till pretty late in the evening, probably till okay. 10 o'clock or something like that. Okay. And so we, you know, and nobody noticed anything. There was no smell. There was like nothing. Um, but the place was basically open because we'd been, you know, we were keeping unleavened bread in there. Um, and then, so then, uh, and I was there till, you know, at least 1030. And then went home and about, I don't know, maybe it was a quarter to 12 or so. I got a phone call from a neighbor saying, hey, there's a huge glow up there. And so I went running up there, and, I mean, it was completely engulfed already. I mean, the flames were clear coming out of the roof. And it was a metal building. So it, it didn't start from the outside. I mean, you know, we're in, you know, kind of a f area where wildfires can happen, but it was April. Everything was wet. There was no wildfires anywhere. Um, you know, they sent the fire department came out and did all their investigations and everything, and they couldn't figure out what caused it. 
They said, well, maybe it was spontaneous combustion or maybe it was electrical. We don't know. So they, yeah, well, thing was, though, even after the building was clear in flames, the electric the electricity was still on on the other in the other half of the building. When I got there, the power was still on in the building. In fact, the fire department, when they first got there, wouldn't fight the fire because the electricity was on. And they were afraid if they squirted water on that it would create, you know, an arc or something and somebody could get electrocuted. So they wouldn't even try to fight the fire until they, the power company got there to shut the power off. <clears throat> so it was really, so how, you know, it seems like if it was electrical that it would have, um, you know, shorted. Yeah, it would have shorted out and blown a fuse or something. Yeah. Uh, and if it was spontaneous combustion of, you know, we did have some totes of grain in there, but they thought maybe they were wet and they, but it seems like that you would have smelled some kind of smoldering for at least an hour or two before it's completely in flames. So who knows? They claim they didn't find any accelerants in the, in there, like somebody didn't put gasoline and light it or something at least not any of the ones they test for so we don't know probably we'll never know wow but 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 you've rebuilt and moved on i guess since then <laughs> we rebuilt and moved on i mean i we talked about it we were all out there one or two in the morning and we went and you know with the family and you know we gathered in prayer and just prayed about it you know, what is it that, you know, that we should do here? You know, are we under attack? Is this an attack of the enemy? Is this an attack? You know, because there was a whole slew of buildings, you know, food plants burning down about that time. And the interesting yeah. part is it wasn't our most, it wasn't the most critical warehouse building that we have, but it is the hmm. one that our head, that our, that our address it's it's the address that we use as our mailing address was that building. Hmm. That's why we call That's it headquarters. Curious. But so it's the address of record. It's the the one that's registered with the FDA and everything as the address of record. Oh. Um, okay. But anyway, hmm. they <clears throat> so we we prayed about it and it's and it's like, yeah, hey, we can either sit here and feel sorry for ourselves or we can get up tomorrow morning and make sure that every order gets out to the best of our ability. It's our choice, and we can make that choice right now. And I said, well, you know, God's given us a ministry to do. There's orders that are in the system that need to be gotten out. You know, there may be a few things that all got burned up and we're not going to be able to deliver, but it's not the majority. It's a, it's a minority of the products. And we'll see if we can't get that going again as fast as we possibly can. And so 6 o'clock the next morning, I got all the kids up, and we went out and pulled starts as kind of, you know, to get to get the orders out because it was <clears throat> um, symbolically this is, this is the path that we wanted to choose. Yeah. If we're going to, if we're going to continue to do it, so I figured, you know, three or four hours of feeling sorry for ourselves was enough. If we could, everyone could be, you know, and, you know, it was a big deal. Um, probably in many ways, the, you know, it, it affected the family more than the product and all that. I mean, it was a lot of money, oh, you know, millions of dollars worth of stuff, but you know, the meeting room and everybody's guitars and musical instruments and all those kinds of things, you know, because it was feast time. That was probably the part that everyone felt the sickest about. How big of a part does perseverance play in business? This You, you had to persevere through this difficult challenge. Have you noticed that this is a big part of being able to do this job and be able to be an entrepreneur? I think it's what, I think it's what separates the men from the boys. 
is exactly that. You know, every business is going to have some hard times, whether it's a fire, whether it's a financial crisis. I actually had a much harder crisis from a financial standpoint due to software issues that that was much more devastating than the fire was back in 2016, 17. And I really didn't recover from that till 2019. So I been, I've been through a few hard times that, you know, that have, but if you don't persevere through those, then, you know, hey, you're just going to go from one thing to another, you know. You can try something else, or you can persevere and move forward with, uh, you know, with the hard times behind us. Um yeah. Well, you know, eventually they'll be in the rearview mirror. If we're completely on the wrong path, and this is a doomed enterprise, then I think that's something that, you know, hopefully God would bring to us if we take it to him in prayer. That's great. That seems like a healthy perspective, and maybe a necessary perspective from where, if you're running a business. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the guy who believes in open doors. You know, I hear a lot of Christians say, hey, if he wanted me to do that, he'd open the door. No, we open the doors. He doesn't open the doors for us. That's our job. He may put the door there, but we have to open it. And, uh, you know, heck, if, if everyone waited for open doors, and a lot of people do, not, a, not very much gets done. Somebody has to open the doors. And I think if we're going to be prosperous, which, you know, that's another thing about Torah teaching. It's all about going out and doing good work and being prosperous. You know, sometimes, you know, modern day Christianity teaches, oh, you know, money is the root of all evil. You don't want to be prosperous. No, that's not, you know. And again, it's irrelevant. Torah-wise, it says you to judge. You don't judge based on wealth of person. You, But if you read Deuteronomy 28 and a few other places as well, wealth is a blessing of God. So there is nothing wrong with getting wealth as long as it's done by the blessings of God and not through corruption of some way, in some way. And so he teaches that that is a blessing, just like he teaches children are a blessing. Wealth is a blessing. Having children is a blessing. Those are two blessings that much of modern Christianity has forgotten about. And there's, you know, that's a, you know, that's a straight from Torah as I know how to get. You're right. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good instructions for life. For living good lives. <laughs> That's right. <sighs> well, all right. Maybe last one. I don't want to keep you forever. How did Azure Well come to be? Well, that's interesting because, you know, Azure Well is our new supplement line. <clears throat> and traditionally, you know, for pretty much as long as Azure's been in business, since I've been in this, I've not put a lot of stock in supplements. I was always, you know, hey, they're okay for, you know, somebody who's really sick or something that's really, um, you know, and we carried a few, but it was a really minor part. My whole focus has been on nutrient-dense food. Let's get our nutrition from our food. Let's not, you know, we shouldn't have to take a bunch of supplements, especially artificial supplements or synthetics, I should say. And so that's been my focus for a long time. And then, you know, actually it started really with Susan, who I think you talked to first. And yeah. um, so Susan, she's been, work, she's worked here at Azure for, I don't know, 25 years anyway, a long time. Been a long time employee, uh, worked here. Um, in pretty, you know, uh, high-functioning capacity. 
And, you know, a few years ago, you know, she ended up getting, um, getting cancer. And I'm not talking just a little cancer. This gal was basically on her deathbed. And, um, and I'm not exaggerating. In fact, the doctor she originally went to gave her two weeks. Oh, wow. This, um, she was just about shutting down. So, um, but she had a lot of, a lot of guts and a lot of fire in her belly. So we worked together and I helped her or my wife did more than I did, but helped her get into a, a treatment center, alternative care treatment center down in Arizona. And so she, you know, she got into that. They were able to do, you know, their processes and everything. And they were able to kill her cancer. Now that didn't happen quick. She went through, I mean, she'll tell you the story. It's, it was a six or eight month process um, that she, I think she was down there for like seven or eight months because, I mean, she was in bad shape. She was bad enough. She couldn't even eat. She was on IV only for a period of time. This was, um, but she eventually, you know, got, um, and the reason we knew about this is that my father-in-law had gotten cancer and he wasn't, you know, Susan always, she wasn't, you know, maybe quite as uh, purist as, as I am, but she was never the kind that just completely poo-pooed healthy eating. You know, she basically ate a reasonably healthy diet. My father-in-law, not so much. He was more a McDonald's guy. But my, you know, my wife took him down to the same clinic and he completely recovered. He got well from his cancer. And then, you know, then then Susan came down with it, went to the same clinic and, you know, over quite a bit of time, because she was way worse shape than he was, um, you know, she gets the, the cancer's dead and it's over and she ends up having to have a surgery to have it removed because it was such a huge mass but it was all dead so they were able to take it out whereas the first guy said oh no I'd kill you if I tried to remove it you know you're gonna you won't be around more than a couple more weeks kind of a thing and she um, so uh, she completely recovered then you know they both went home and started back on, you know, their, you know, and they were supposed to have a little healthier diets. And all, but, you know, he felt great and he seemed like he was cancer free and it was all good. And so he started slipping back into keen to keep, you know, the couple years after he was cancer free of the same mm. cancer because he didn't, you know, he didn't do the supplements and he also slipped back into some of his old habits maybe not mcdonald's but you know it was subway or something now it's no not quite as bad but you know definitely a long ways from the organic food that he was supposed to be on Mm -hmm. well susan she did exactly the opposite she went and she began to research and and look for all the supplements and way more than the clinic that she was at even prescribed. And she searched and and looked, and we realized that there was a dearth, there was a very, of supplements that were not synthetic-based or had synthetic. So, you know, it was very, very hard to find. So we started working with different folks. Dr. Monzo was one of them, as far as finding formulations for supplements. And Susan started that. And then she says, you know, we can't even get good supplements. And she says, they're say, you know, this is what's made the difference between me being, she's like healthier than she's ever been. And, you know, a couple years later, and my father-in-law being dead a couple years later. Mm. And I felt, you know, hey, supplements was a, their dedication to their nutrition whether that's through food or through supplements. But in this case, when you're down and out and you just went through cancer treatment, probably supplement everyday basis, they become important if we're nutritionally deficient. 
and but finding supplements that are without all these silicon dioxide or whatever else all the different excipients that tie up the nutrients finding whole food supplements became was extremely difficult so susan went out and basically made it her mission to find those and so we we started form some of them we formulated ourselves and some of them are ones that we found and and put our label on most of them are our formulations of some sort and susan's driven most of that because she's felt like that's what saved her life um after the fact because even when some of the people she went to you know treatment with many of those have had reoccurrences because the follow-up to, you know, and it's not just cancer, it's any of these diseases. The follow-up and that lifestyle is so much import, more important than the cure itself. Yeah, anybody can get, well, I don't know about anybody, there's probably a point of no return. But pretty much anybody can get well with the right treatment. But staying well long-term, that's where the where the rubber meets the road. We want to live a long and healthy, prosperous life. Or, you know, or is this just about tomorrow? And so we figured, hey, if there's a dearth in the market and nobody's really vetting it, and even some companies, even though they have one or two things that are pretty natural, you can't trust the whole line. So our idea was, hey, let's create a line that customers can trust. They know these are all whole food excipients. There's no fillers. There's no flowing agents there's none of that crap in it and this is the real thing and so we've worked with dr monzo susan has and a couple of other doctors as well um to formulate the line you know is it perfect probably not but i believe it's the best that that's on the market it's the best that you know and susan's dedicated the last roughly three years pretty much full time to this project and wow, it's... I'm glad that she has. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Would so you... I changed my mind a little bit that supplements are not j just a waste of time. There is definitely a place for them. You've seen, if we you've have seen the right it now. Ones. I've seen it firsthand, and I believe it. Um, I don't take a lot of supplements still, but I've been eating organically for, you know, 40 years. That's great. Well, you know, nutrient dense food. That's not the case with most folks. Most folks are coming in, even if they start eating nutrient dense organic food, they're coming in with a deficit. And here's a way to make that up. So. Thank you then for your time, sir. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure to get to talk to you, pick your brain on all these different levels. Well, nice talking to you as well. Thank you, sir.